Hi, and thank you for joining our educational webinar with Drs. Macy Ross and Mary Helen Hackney, who will discuss the importance of developing a follow-up care plan and how you can maintain your health after completing cancer treatment. My name is Sharni Smith, and I am a member of UC Health's marketing team. So before we start, I'd like to make note that we will hold all questions until the very end. So please feel free to drop your questions in the comments section and we will address them during our Q&A. So now I will introduce our speakers. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ross. She is a medical oncologist and serves as a medical director of clinical research affiliations at VCU Massey Cancer Center and VCU School of Medicine. She is also the medical director of Massey's Integrative Health Program and an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology, Oncology, and Palliative Care in the Department of Internal Medicine at the VCU School of Medicine. She attended medical school at Loyola Stretch School of Medicine and completed her residency and fellowship at VCU. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thank you for Hi, having me. Hi, thanks for having me. And then next, I'll introduce Dr. Hackney. She is a medical oncologist and the medical director of the Community Oncology at VCU, Massey Cancer Center, and VCU School of Medicine. She's an associate professor and the director of quality improvement in the Division of Hematology, Oncology, and Palliative Care in the Department of Internal Medicine at the VCU School of Medicine. She attended medical school at East Carolina University School of Medicine and completed her residency and fellowship at VCU. Hi, Dr. Hackney, thanks for joining us. Hello. So thank you both, and I will now turn the show over to you, Dr. Hackney. Very good, thank you. Well, we're gonna be talking about living well after cancer today. And uh, I wanna start out with first talking a little bit about side effects and things that you may find that happen after treatment for cancer. And then Dr. Ross is gonna talk a little bit more about wellness and health and taking care of your body after you get through cancer treatment. Because we have to recognize that there are many, many survivors these days. And some of them may be having some challenges after their treatment. Let's go to the next slide. We have to think, you know, we think about uh, how many people get diagnosed with cancer. And there are tons of cases of cancer in men and women. Uh, the biggest cancer killer, unfortunately, is still lung cancer. Uh, but prostate is the second biggest one in men for occurrence, breast cancer with women. But you recognize many, many people do not die of these cancers, uh, particularly breast. There's a lot of long life. Uh, and with uh, lymphoma and others, many people are going to live many long lives. And so we need to think about how we're going to take care of ourselves after a cancer diagnosis. Next slide. When you think about it, it's hard to believe, but one out of two men, if you live to age 90, and one out of three women living to age 90 will be diagnosed with cancer. So that means many of us will be touched. It's always important to remember that cancer does not equal death. I mean, we tend to worry about that. It doesn't equal death. Many more are surviving. And if you look at this chart, it says that of all the people who are diagnosed with cancer, um, almost 70% of them are going to be alive at five years. And that means even more are going to be alive longer. Next slide. And they predict by what year 2040, just 20 years from now, we'll have 26 million cancer survivors. Uh, so we see the number rising and rising. We know that cancer is predominantly a disease of the older population, but that group also, the, what shows up in the sort of purple color here, uh, that number is increasing too in terms of survivorship. Next slide. So how do you define a survivor? Now, it used to be everybody called a survivor. You had to be five years. That meant you were, quote, cancer-free or the best dead, and you were considered a survivor. What they really think about now is that once you start doing something to fight your cancer, that's when you become a survivor. So that could be with surgery. That could be with chemotherapy. That's your first start to uh, marking off your time as a cancer survivor. And that fits with the Commission on Cancer Guidelines to providing summaries about survivorship and guidelines to patients about what to do within that first year of diagnosis. Interestingly, there was an article that was published last year 
And a new thing we have to think about is that many people who have a cancer recurrence are also going to live a long time. Uh, we see uh, people with breast cancer who have a recurrence uh, predominantly in bones who may live another five, 10 years after their recurrence. We're seeing that with melanoma, with the new immunotherapy drugs, and with some of the other cancers that respond to immunotherapies. So you also have to think about how we're going to take care of these survivors who are living with cancer, not just living beyond cancer. Next slide. So there are two big articles, and uh, one I've listed here if anybody decides they want to get into the New England Journal on cancer survivorship by Dr. Shapiro. It lists a plethora of uh, things for cancer survivors to be following and for their primary care and their oncologists to be following as well. Next slide. Another talk, as I mentioned earlier, also last year, a big article, an article was published saying that we need to look at that metastatic patient who may live a long time and what consequences might they have to their lives, their family, their workplaces uh, as they deal with long-term care of cancer. Next slide. So the Institute of Medicine, which is a you know, big organization that evaluates uh, how we take care of all kinds of uh, diseases, published a report a few years back and said we need to do a better job as physicians educating our patients about things that might happen during their cancer treatment. So more and more we're emphasizing a teamwork approach to making your diagnosis and making your treatment. And they want us to be more involved in providing you information about what your prognosis is for cancer, what the short and long-term side effects of the treatment might be. And so we like to have informed patients. Uh, it's always amazing when they come in with a sheet of paper with a ton of questions, because as we work as a team to take care of you, you're going to have a better result and you're going to feel better in the long run too. Next slide, please. So with the cancer survivorship, what they're saying is that at all stages of cancer treatment, we need to be talking about how we can better provide patient education. Uh, there are templates if you look at ASCO uh, and it has, that's our national oncology organization. It has a website called www.cancer.net, www.cancer.net. And that is specifically for patients. And as a patient, you can look up on that website, look up your disease and then look up information about how you should be followed if you have that cancer. They've got guidelines for lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate, um, colon cancer, rectal cancer, uh, lymphoma. And it says, how often do you get scans? How often do you see your doctor? Has questions to ask your doctor, when to call, when to worry. So that's a great resource for patients. And I really encourage people to look at that. Uh, the Commission on Cancer um, also wants us to address these needs. And uh, about what may happen after treatment. Uh, Dr. Ross is going to talk a little bit about that, but part of it is really emphasizing health and wellness after treatment. So that's an, another key part. If you have breast cancer, uh, the Breast Cancer Accreditation Program is asking that we actually provide you with a written document that talks about some of those guidelines for survivorship, potential side effects, what to do if you have certain symptoms, and how you're going to be followed, how often you have visits, what kind of screening do you have. So we're trying to better educate everybody from physicians, uh, both primary care and oncologists, as well as um, our patients, because that's going to make the biggest improvement in how we can take care of people. Next slide. So if we start thinking about, you know, who can care for a cancer patient, people who can care for a cancer patient include uh, a medical oncologist, a surgical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant working with these, these physicians. But primary care is also very involved. And there may be other specialists involved. So at all different times of care, these people may be involved. And there's not one person who can do it all. 
and realize that the key is that you are being seen according to guidelines. Uh, so this tells you a little bit about what some of those guidelines are uh, and who can do it. Your primary care can do a breast exam and order your mammogram as well as your oncologist. Some areas where we don't have many oncologists, we depend more on the primary care to help as well. So we work as a team to take care of any patient with cancer. Next slide, please. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the challenges for that survivor. Uh, and these are some of the things we commonly hear about, that fear of recurrence, sometimes the survivorship guilt is somebody else you know has a cancer, they may not have done as well and you are doing fine. The risk of second cancers, um, organ system dysfunction has the cancer treatment affected other major organs, pain and discomfort, particularly long lasting, um, health and wellness, as again, Dr. Ross is gonna talk about, cognitive changes, how well our brains work after treatment, uh, fertility and sexuality, and screening challenges. What do we do uh, for different cancers? Next slide, please. Uh, so, hmm, I thought I missed a slide there. We're okay. Uh, so what I wanted to do is spend something that no one like, no one really wants to talk about, but everybody wants to talk about it. Uh, sometimes it's hard to start the conversations about sexuality, fertility after cancer care. It's a big thing because many people are treated in their uh, prime years of their life and sexuality it can be for many years. Uh, fertility preservation should always start before you start treatment. Uh, and so if you are a young person who may be considering being a father or mother in your future, you talk to your physicians before you get the first drop of chemotherapy, uh, sometimes even before you get surgery, to see how that might affect your ability to have children in the future. It's good to know that having a pregnancy after breast cancer does not increase your risk of breast cancer. That's a big fear. But we know that chemotherapy may affect uh, sperm counts. It may affect a woman's ability to have periods. It may affect uh, the life of, of um, her eggs. So all of those things need to be discussed and preservation opportunities uh, offered. Uh, some drugs are more likely to cause problems than other drugs, and some people may make a decision on treatment based on those risks. Again, an open conversation. Next slide, please. The other thing is that with all of these different drugs in your system, you know, your, uh, your interest in others, your interest in enjoying sex may change. And it can be really embarrassing sometimes. And I have patients who are sort of sitting there going, let's talk. Sometimes it's the spouse who brings it up, but it can be differences in you know, how your body looks. Um, we do know that when people undergo a cancer diagnosis, there are lots of stresses that can be on stress on the relationship. Uh, sometimes single people find uh, difficult to date because they have, you know, maybe admitting what they've gone through. Uh, there have been some studies of increased divorce in women with cancer. Um, some women go through menopause in their 20s and 30s. That's a terrible time uh, to become, as somebody said, a little old lady. Um, I think we don't recognize that sometimes if people have had cancer, it doesn't mean that adoption is always an option. Uh, many adoption agencies will not uh, release a child to somebody with can who has had cancer until so many years have passed. So it's not an automatic um, fail. Uh, alternative. The other challenge is that, you know, partners may be uncomfortable. Are they going to hurt you? Can they touch you? Um, and your body may, a person's body may look different. And so sometimes some counseling and support through that will be very useful. Next slide. The physical changes. How do you deal with ostomies, uh, scars, erectile dysfunction? We've got many great urologists who work on this and can help vaginal changes uh, for women. So there are other products that might be out there that can also help in terms of enjoyment of uh, intimacy. And so the key is not be afraid to ask and then get directed to somebody who can help. And uh, there are things that can be that can help. Next slide. 
The other thing that a lot of people worry about is how their brain works, especially after chemotherapy. A lot of this was first defined with bone marrow transplant, and we found that people's thinking wasn't quite as sharp as it used to be. And so there's been more and more research about what causes the brain to not work as well. And a large part of it is probably the drugs that we're using. But there's also an overlying problem of depression, anxiety, sometimes some post-traumatic stress disorder from going through all the therapy, going through the treatment, that fear of recurrence, every little ache or pain brings up an anxiety. Uh, there may be other stresses that are going on, loss of job, loss of housing, um, chronic pain. All of these factors may play in and there are interventions. Um, just a few of them are listed here from antidepressants to counseling, uh, to better pain control. And that does not mean necessarily drugs. There are so many other things we can do for pain. So again, asking, being aware. Uh, these are perfectly uh, acceptable and we see these things. Next slide. The cognitive changes, uh, chemo fog, chemo brain, as I said, often was first described in bone marrow transplant patients, but we see it in almost anyone, potential in getting chemotherapy. What helps? Getting good sleep, adequate rest, lim limiting multitasking, hard to do with all of us on the computer these days, but you gotta think about it. And limiting medications that can interfere with brain function, You know, using uh, medications for sleep, some of the antidepressants, all of these things may slow function down. So looking at alternatives that may keep the brain a little bit uh, more alive and well. They keep trying different things to help with brain function um, and nothing's clearly been there yet. Uh, they're actually looking at some medications for people who are getting brain radiation that might help preserve memory and help function. So that looks very promising. So time is probably your biggest healer here and limiting medications. Next slide, please organ dysfunction. There's so many things that can happen due to chemotherapy. Your doctors will be monitoring these things. We know we have to watch kidney function with some drugs. We know that cardiac dysfunction with others. Pulmonary dysfunction may actually last for years after treatment, particularly patients who've received treatment for testicular cancer, receiving a drug like bleomycin. Uh, we also know that some of our new uh, immunotherapy drugs can cause pulmonary problems. So these are things that need to be monitored and the patient needs to be aware to let anybody who's taking care of them know, say, this was my drugs, these are what I got. The bone marrow problems, not as common as they used to be with the drugs we use, but they're still there. And so we still worry about, can some of the drugs we give to fight one cancer create a second cancer? It's very uncommon, but it's not unheard of. And it's certainly something to be aware of. Next slide. Cardiac oncology is, sorry, I just have to check that time, you know. Cardiac oncology is a new specialty. Uh, it is, and we're very fortunate at VCU to have two cardiac oncologists. Uh, and this is looking at toxicity from different drugs and how that might affect the heart. And if the heart is affected, does that also affect fatigue? Does that affect ability to exercise and other functions? So we know that some of the drugs that cause heart damage, that heart damage is reversible. Some of the drugs cause permanent heart damage. Anthracycline, doxorumicin can be more permanent. Her two new drugs, Herceptin, Tristuzumab, mostly reversible. We know that radiation can also impact the heart function, particularly to the lungs, the chest, uh, the breast, lymph node areas for lymphoma. All of those might impact heart function. So doctors are aware of this. And sometimes the heart function problems don't show up for another five, 10, 15 years down the road. So 15 years down the road, somebody needs to be thinking, okay, I'm having some heart issues. Could that have been due to what I was treated with in the past? It's a question worth asking. And there are interventions depending on what the situation is. Next slide, please. Uh, the current monitoring for heart problems is using either an echocardiogram 
or a nuclear test called a MUGA test or first pass test. But one of the big exciting things we're doing here at VCU is using cardiac MRIs, which gives a very functional um, measure of the heart and strain of the heart. And they're hoping that they're going to be able to detect subtle changes earlier. And they're looking at some medications that might help influence the heart and help maintain good function, even while somebody's under treatment. Um, I do always suggest that if somebody who has had chemotherapy is going and then is thinking about a pregnancy, that they make sure their heart is monitored before and during and after during pregnancy, uh, because pregnancy can put a strain on the heart. And so if the patient, if a woman has had heart toxic drugs, it's a good idea to double check that uh, and uh, hopefully prevent uh, future problems. Next slide, please. Lymphedema, we tend to think of it with breast cancer, but we have to recognize it can happen with gynecologic cancer surgeries, lymphoma, testicular cancer surgeries, melanoma surgeries, all can remove lymph nodes that can lead to swelling of either a leg or an arm. Uh, and that is what lymphedema is essentially described as. Radiation therapy and infection can increase the risk. Complications of surgery can increase the risk but not everybody gets lymphedema who has lymph nodes removed. Uh, the newer techniques that we're using with using sentinel node mapping, much less risk than there were uh, a decade or more ago. The key is if you start to see some swelling in a lower, in an extremity, your legs or an arm on a side where you've had surgery, is to get in to see a physical therapist or an occupational therapist who's trained in lymphedema management. That's really the first step. They now actually have some new surgical options of transposing lymph nodes uh, and vessels that might help reduce that as well. So as for the latest and greatest, there may be some opportunity for you, but the key is intervention early can really make a difference. Next slide, please. Pain and discomfort. Okay, let me see where. Pain and discomfort, it can be from radiation, it can be from surgery, it can be from chemotherapy. Uh, there are a lot of uh, opportunity or op possible causes. The key is, again, talking with your physician. Next slide, please. Uh, the key is talking with your physician about what is out there that might help. Uh, again, some drugs cause neuropathy. Uh, there are a lot of new medications that might help neuropathy. There's uh, nerve stimulators that have been tried. Uh, and there's actually a clinical trial looking at some uh, newer non-sedating drugs that might help with neuropathy. And we're one of the centers offering that clinical trial. Next slide, please. Other challenges, insomnia, fatigue, not uncommon when people have gone through so much therapy. Uh, they're, we're trying to use non-pharmacologic interventions looking at behavioral modifications for insomnia. Uh, there's uh, a new pathway I was just uh, found out about that help people get their brain into a good space to go to sleep. Fatigue can be multifactorial, looking at thyroid, looking for anemia, um, looking at stress reduction, all of those things might help with uh, long-term fatigue. Next slide. Key thing too is there are a lot of things that are happening out there to try to help people even afterwards. Uh, as I said earlier, we have a neuropathy trial looking at long-term problems with neuropathy, trying another intervention. Uh, we have a weight control trial for some patients. Uh, we have a new trial open for lymphoma and breast cancer patients for fatigue and trying to help maximize energy. Uh, we have a rehab physician who is working with that energy restoration uh, so ask your doctor for help if you find that your body's not getting where you want it to be fast enough. But you may also try some of these things that Dr. Ross is going to talk about, about wellness after treatment. So let me turn it over to her. Thank you. Good evening. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, just uh, following Dr. Hatney about wellness. And uh, we're going to sort of look at this as a holistic approach. Uh, for cancer survivors or patients who have been through cancer before. Um, and the way I sort of like to look at this is 
uh, in three sort of three broad categories. So how can we cultivate healthy behaviors? What sort of behaviors may not be as healthy and how can we avoid those uh, that might increase our risk for uh, subsequent cancers or cancer recurrence? And then of course, keeping up on cancer screening. So in terms of cultivating a healthy lifestyle, there are a lot of things that go into, you know, being your healthiest healthy. But um, the three things that I'm going to focus on uh, for this talk is the role of exercise, physical activity, uh, nutrition, and then stress management. Those are some, I think, big sort of high impact areas that we can really focus on uh, to help promote a healthy lifestyle after cancer. Uh, we also think about modification of high risk behavior. So again, things that can increase your risk for developing other types of cancers or perhaps increase your risk of recurrence. And the ones that we're gonna focus on uh, this evening are smoking cessation, so tobacco use, and then weight management. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then we'll go through some of the uh, cancer screening guidelines. So physical activity is really important and uh, sort of across all of the different um, organizations, uh, there are several recommendations on how much physical activity somebody who's been who, through cancer should be getting. So these are the recommendations that are uh, endorsed by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network and also the American Cancer Society. And they say that we should aim to get at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity activity or 75 minutes of vigorous activity every week. We're going to go through some examples of those in just a moment. They also say that we should aim for two to three sessions of strength or resistance training every week, in addition to the aerobic activity. Next size, slide, please. So in terms of exercise, uh, they sort of break things down into moderate activity and vigorous activity. So under the moderate activity, now remember this is uh, the recommendation for 150 to 300 minutes of moderate activity per week. And the way you can sort of know if you're doing a moderate activity is they say that you can talk during the activity, but you wouldn't be able to sing. So you can sort of think about what level of breath control you need for these different activities. And examples of moderate activities would, or moderate exercise activity would be dancing, biking on flat ground, gardening, doubles tennis, brisk walking or yoga. Vigorous activity, so if you participate in vigorous activities, you need less of them per week, so 75 minutes per week. And this uh, is defined by activity in which you can say a few words without stopping for a breath, but you can't talk fluently during that activity. So these would be things like biking fast, hiking up a hill, jumping rope, jogging or running, basketball, singles tennis or climbing stairs. Next slide, please. Strength resistance training should include major muscle groups. So think about exercises that where you can use your chest, your shoulders, arms, back, core, legs. And the organizations say that we should really aim to do this two to three times per week. And they give us a little bit of, of an example in terms of how many repetitions we should be doing. So if we're uh, doing exercises, doing some weights or uh, some sort of resistance training, we should try to do two to three sets of 10 to 15 repetitions per set. And we should do that two to three times per week. And they do say, of course, tailor weight amount to allow for 10 to 15 repetitions. And of course, all of these physical act activity recommendations should be tailored to the individual. So if somebody has, you know, cardiac risk factors or other sorts of health conditions, they obviously may limit arthritis and those sorts of things obviously may limit uh, which types of exercises are best. In terms of nutrition, one of the uh, places to start, I think that's really important is to try to assess what you're, where you're at. So what are your dietary patterns right now? Um, try to think about how much, how many calories you're getting in a day. And there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, there are calorie trackers these days. There are a lot of apps on, uh, if people have smartphones, there are apps that you can use or even just writing down in a journal so that it's sort of knowing your starting point can help you to make informed choices. 
Uh, the recommendation from the National Cancer, uh, National Comprehensive Cancer uh, Network is that we should aim to have at least 50% of our diet plant-based. And that really means uh, consisting of vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. Uh, they recommend limiting red meat to less than 18 ounces per week and avoiding processed meats. So that's things like deli meats. Limit refined sugars and processed foods and avoid sugar sweetened beverages. The beverages is something I just wanted to um, point out for a second because I think that sometimes beverages can sort of be overlooked. And a lot of people... Um, would be amazed, I think, at it, how many calories the, the beverages uh, have in them. So things like, you know, sodas, uh, sweet teas, alcohol is listed. Of course, alcohol is high in calories. So think about uh, what beverages you're drinking, and that may be a way that you can significantly reduce calorie intake. Uh, and again, the first step is just sort of tracking what you're doing. So noticing uh, how many beverages you might be having and, and how many calories may be in those. Next slide, please. Another significant thing uh, that's, I think, particularly important right now, uh, especially during the COVID pandemic, is, is thinking about stress. So what are some things that we can do to try to reduce our stress? This is a slide that I uh, made based on the National Institute of Mental Health, and they have a lot of great resources on their website. It's an NIH website. And they say that there's five things that we should know about stress. One is recognize that everybody has stress. So stress affects everyone. Nobody is excluded. But not all stress is bad. The important thing is knowing when, when stress may be motivating or may be helpful and when it can start to adversely impact your health. So long-term stress can it really be where stress starts to uh, have negative impacts on your health. But there are ways to manage stress. And most importantly, if you're feeling overwhelmed by a stress, please reach out and ask for help from a health professional and see what kind of things uh, may be available to help you manage. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, when stress becomes chronic, uh, or long-term sort of unrelenting, that's when it really becomes problematic. So if the source of the stress is constant, or if maybe the stressor improves or goes away, but the physical response to that stressor continues after that, that stressor is gone. And therefore the body gets no clear signal to return to normal functioning. That's when it really becomes problematic. So these are some stress management tips. So just like we talked about with uh, reducing caloric intake and making healthy nutritional choices, the first step is recognizing the signs of stress and sort of assessing where you are. Some people that are uh, having a lot of stressors may have problems sleeping. They may feel like their uh, mood is altered or they're easily angered. They may just feel down. Uh, or have low energy, and some people may turn to uh, substance abuse. Again, talk to your healthcare provider, reach out for help. We know that getting regular exercise can be really helpful, help uh, boost mood and reduce stress and, uh, and motivating. Try a relaxing activity. So there are several uh, research studies that show, particularly for breast cancer patients, but other types of cancers as well, that meditation and yoga can be very helpful for stress and anxiety. There are other sorts of activities according to your interests, like Tai Chi, that may be helpful as well. And set goals and priorities and start small. So think about in terms of whatever your list is for the day or whatever your stressors are, what are the things that you really have to tackle or get done that day and what can wait? Uh, what are the things that are, that are really important right now uh, versus things that maybe can wait until next week and things that maybe can wait until, until next month? And then think about who, who can you call in to help maybe with different tasks if you're feeling overwhelmed um, with whatever the circumstances that, that you're uh, engaging in. And then stay connected. And that's really hard to do sometimes, especially um, during the pandemic when maybe physical activity is limited and travel is restricted. So make sure that you're staying connected in the, in the ways that you can, you know, either talking on the phone or through Zoom, um, connected to your friends and your family, but also to your community. That can help a lot with stress, uh, stress management and coping with stressors. 
what about reducing cancer risk? So I said that we were going to talk about maybe some behaviors to uh, try to encourage. And these are some behaviors maybe uh, that we want to try to discourage or just ways that we can avoid uh, risks that may increase our risk for developing other cancers or increase our risk of recurrence. So a couple, there are all sorts of different risks, but some of the ones that are most high impact are things like avoiding smoking, uh, a tobacco cessation, achieving and maintaining a healthy body weight. We know that certain uh, sexually transmitted infections can increase your risk of uh, different cancers. For example, HPV can increase your risk of uh, cervical cancer, certain HPV strains. Um, we know it's important to avoid excess sun and tanning beds, particularly for skin cancers, melanomas. And then we want to think about avoiding other environmental exposures, things like asbestos, radon, that we know have been uh, shown to increase the risk of certain cancers. So smoking cessation, tobacco use is the most preventable cause of cancer, and it's thought to uh, account for about one fifth of total cancer deaths worldwide. Uh, there's been a lot of research looking at what are the most effective ways to help people uh, quit smoking. And what they really found is that it's a combination of medications and behavior therapy. So in terms of medications, there are uh, different nicotine replacement therapies, and there's a drug called varenicycline that has been shown to be effective. And this is really most effective when combined with multiple counseling sessions. One thing that I think is really important to remember is that most people can't stop trying on their first, uh, their first attempt. Relapses are very, very common. So don't feel discouraged by that. Uh, keep trying and talk to your healthcare provider, either your oncologist or your primary care, about what resources may be available, um, either at your doctor's office or within your community um, to help you get to where you need to be. Achieving a healthy weight is also really important. So obesity has been shown to be the second most preventable uh, cause of cancer behind tobacco use. So just as a reminder, obesity is defined as having a body mass index greater than 30. There are lots of online calculators or ways uh, that you can calculate your BMI to determine where you're at on that scale. And there are lots of possible mechanisms that are thought to link obesity to cancer. Uh, that includes influence of sex hormones, inflammation, um, different acute re uh, phase reactants and stressors. Um, and so th there's a clear link there uh, between obesity and cancer. And so really trying to get uh, your weight down uh, can be uh, really helpful. This is a chart showing the relative cancer risk for men and women who are obese or with a body mass index over 30. So you, if you look in men, obese men have an increased risk of several cancers, including esophageal cancer. So they have a one and a half times increased risk compared to uh, pe people who are not obese. The same thing goes for colon cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, and prostate cancer. In females uh, or in women, endometrial cancer is increased by about 1.6 fold. Uh, for women who are obese. The same thing goes with gallbladder. There's also a link for uh, breast cancer, particularly postmenopausal hormone positive breast cancer and pancreatic and colon cancers. The increased risk is predominantly, if you notice the trend here, in gastrointestinal malignancies and in hormone uh, related malignancies. Next slide, please. This is another um, study, sort of showing very similar findings. And this is a, a forest plot. So it's a way to look at where the risk is compared to the different factors. And so what you can see that I've highlighted here in men and women is that the risk of esophageal cancer in a, an obese man, again, was about one and a half times higher than the risk of esophageal cancer in men who had a normal weight. They also showed an increased risk for men uh, in developing thyroid cancer, colon cancer, and kidney cancer. 
in women, uh, very similar findings to the last slide. So increased risk of endometrial cancer, gallbladder cancer, esophageal cancer, and kidney cancers. And you can see here, there's some increased uh, other risk. Anything to the right of the line there is the increased risk as the, as the body mass index goes up. Um, and this really was looking at in individuals with a body mass index of 25, 23. So those are non-obese non individuals. Uh, this chart is really showing that if those individuals gained either 15 kilograms in men or 13 kilograms in women, which is about 20 to 30 pounds, their risk went up significantly uh, in, these, in all these different respective cancers. So that really highlights the importance for people who are at uh, a normal weight to really try to maintain that weight. And for those that are um, uh, already in the obese category, there are some recommendations put forth by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network at how we can uh, get the weight down to where it needs to be uh, to try to minimize your risk of these types of cancers. So if you look here at the middle of the chart, um, principles of weight loss that they recommend. Again, they stress limiting foods that are high in calories, particularly those that are uh, sort of nutrient, uh, not nutrient dense, but, but high calorie uh, foods and drinks. So sugar sweetened beverages, um, lots of desserts, fried foods, fast foods, those can really have a lot of calories without much nutritional benefit. They say to substitute those kind of foods uh, with nutrient dense foods, such as fruits, vegetables, soups, whole grains, and really look at your portions too. Are you um, eating uh, appropriate portions or are you really you know, loading uh, more on, on the carbs and less of the fruits and vegetables? And how can you sort of make those subtle changes uh, to improve your overall nutrition? Uh, they say to make informed choices based on routine evaluation of food labels, and that's really, really important. Obviously, your fresh, fr fresh fruits and vegetables, those sorts of things won't have food labels, but a lot of the processed and packaged foods uh, will have food labels, and, and you can look at those to determine what's actually uh, in them. What are, the, what are the calories, but also what sort of nutrients are you getting uh, so that you can make those informed choices. In terms of the weight loss, they really don't recommend more than two pounds per week. And for people who are over 64, they recommend uh, weight loss at one pound per week or, or less. So then, so again, these are gradual changes to incorporate uh, so that you can achieve a healthy weight, but we're not talking about you know, massive weight loss in a short period of time. Uh, that's not the healthiest way, way to maintain or to achieve a healthy weight. Uh, as we mentioned before, they say to track diet, calories, and physical activity routines. So, you know, before you can make change, you sort of have to know where your changes need to come from, what your starting point is, and what your goals are. Next slide, please. What about weight loss drugs? So sometimes we get questions about these. And in the cancer population, there's really no current safety data um, for these drugs. So uh, well, we have a lot of conversations about them. Of course, if that's something that you're interested in, you should definitely talk to your um, healthcare provider, whether it's your oncologist or your primary care. But so far, there doesn't seem to be a major role for weight loss drugs uh, for cancer survivors for getting their weight down to a healthy, healthy place. Okay, we're gonna shift now to talk about cancer screening. So as Dr. Hackney had mentioned, there is a thought that there, there can be a risk of new cancers and cancer survivors that can be higher than the general population. This can be for a multitude of reasons. So it may be that individuals have genetic susceptibilities or if they have a family history of cancer. There can also be this concept of shared exposures. So we know that certain risks uh, certain uh, things like tobacco use can increase the risk of both lung and head and neck cancers. Or as we just discussed, uh, being overweight may increase the risk of esophageal cancer and breast cancer. So there are certain things that can increase the risk of uh, certain factors that can increase the risk of multiple cancers. 
Additionally, cancer treatments may increase the risk of subsequent cancer. So we don't see this very often, but there are certain chemotherapy drugs that can increase the risk of developing other cancers like leukemia down the road. So it's really important to keep up with cancer screening recommendations. We're gonna go over a few of the recommendations today. Uh, we're gonna go over breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, prostate, uh, colorectal and lung cancer screening. So in terms of breast cancer screening, um, it, there are lots of different national uh, and global guidelines and these guidelines can vary. Um, it's important to talk to your doctor about it and there's an emphasis on shared decision making. Uh, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network are really the, the guidelines that we follow. And this is, uh, recom it's recommended that you get an annual screening mammogram starting at age 40. American Cancer Survive, uh, Society says that you can have the opportunity to begin cancer screening, breast cancer screening starting at age 45, but that everybody should really be getting a uh, regular screening mammogram starting at age 45. In terms of cervical cancer, uh, you can see here on this table, this is um, from the American Journal of uh, uh, Clinical Pathology, but it also is endorsed by NCCN. And so cancer, cervical cancer screening really should begin at age 21. And between age 21 and 29, it's recommended that women get pap smears every three years. Now, of course, if they get a pap smear and there's an abnormal finding, then subsequent workup and screenings will, will uh, be tailored to whatever that abnormal finding is. But assuming the pap smear is normal, they should get pap smears every three years between age 21 and 29. And then when they hit age 30, a woman can get what's called co-testing. So that involves getting a pap smear as well as an HPV test. We know that human papillomavirus or HPV, certain strains can increase the risk of cervical cancer. And so if a woman is negative for HPV, then she can go uh, to every five years getting her uh, co-testing. Whereas if she's positive, there may be other recommendations in terms of either uh, increase, uh, referring to colposcopy, which is a procedure, uh, or uh, doing the uh, next pap smear at a closer interval. Over age 65, no screening is really uh, recommended, but I would encourage you to talk to your, um, your primary care or your oncologist about that um, because sometimes those, are, uh, those recommendations are tailored accord according to what else is going on. Um, and then women who have had a hyster hysterectomy as long as all of the cervix has been removed also don't need uh, screening. Next slide, please. In terms of prostate cancer early detection, so there are a few different uh, recommendations here depending on which guideline you look at. Uh, the NCCN uh, says that between age 45 and 75 uh, that we can consider doing a serum PSA or prostate sensitive antigen. And if a PSA is less than one and they have a normal uh, exam, then the repeat testing is done at two to four year intervals. Um, and you can see here that if the PSA is elevated, so if it's between one to three, uh, they recommend decreasing that interval that they get the next PSA level checked. And if the PSA is high, uh, three or above, according to NCCN, um, then they really should have further evaluation. This usually, recommend, uh, this usually entails referral to a urologist and potential biopsy. American Cancer, Society, uh, American Cancer Society recommendations are very similar, although they have slightly different cutoffs in terms of their PSA uh, in their uh, next interval at which they would check the level. Colorectal cancer screening. So this is uh, mainly referring to colonoscopy, which is the gold standard for detecting colorectal cancer. And the reason for that is it can be both a diagnostic and a thera therapeutic tool. So not only does the colonoscopy help screen for colon cancer, but if somebody has a polyp that is maybe a precancerous uh, polyp, that, can, that polyp can be oftentimes removed during the colonoscopy. The NCCN recommends that we start getting colonoscopies at age uh, 50. Um, and the American Cancer Society recommends colonoscopy starting at age 45. Um, there is some data, too, to suggest um, 
that uh, starting in the 40s is particularly important for African-American individuals. Um, there are some other options for colorectal cancer screening if uh, colonoscopy is either not available uh, in your community or based on if there's a strong patient preference or a reason that someone can't get a colonoscopy. There are some stool-based tests um, where they're basically looking for stool blood. Uh, there's also a flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is um, which is an, uh, sort of a limited colonoscopy, so um, it still involves um, uh, scope and, and a camera, but it, it doesn't uh, look in the whole colon. And then there are some CT or imaging based uh, screening uh, modalities as well. Lung cancer screening uh, recommendations are really based on age and uh, exposures, mainly to tobacco use. So it's recommended that um, there is that individuals get a low dose chest CT. So low dose means less radiation exposure uh, for people that meet the following criteria. So age between 55 and 74, and at least 30 pack year smoking history. A pack year smoking history means that if somebody smokes a pack of cigarettes per day uh, for 30 years, that's 30 pack year smoking history. Uh, if somebody smokes two packs per year, for 50, or it's two packs per day for 15 years, that's also equal to a 30 uh, pack year smoking history. So if somebody has at least that, uh, that much smoking history or they're current smokers or have quit within the last 15 years, then they really should be getting a low dose uh, chest CT. Uh, also, they say, you know, make sure that somebody's in relatively good health because um, if somebody, you know, is suffering from a lot of other medical conditions or has other um, health priorities, you know, that, that may not be as important. Um, and then NCCN says that you also may consider doing a low dose chest CT for people who have a 20 pack year smoking history, but they may have another risk factor, um, some sort of environmental exposure that increases their risk. Uh, in addition to the smoking, uh, then they also should undergo the low dose chest CT. So I think with that, um, that concludes our uh, portion of the formal portion of the talk. And I think now we're going to open it up to questions. Yes, thank you both so much. So we've had two questions that come in. So the first question, relaxing the definition of survivor makes folks feel good, but does the newer definition raise any issues about comparing the cancer studies that we're reviewing year after year? Um, I'll take that one. I'll leave the next one for Macy. Uh, I don't think so, because when we usually do studies, we're looking at the presence or absence of cancer. So that can be followed monthly, yearly, whatever. So um, adjusting the survivorship rule uh, does not really affect the studies. Uh, the key is what's happening in that individual. Okay. Thank you. And have you seen that a lot of patients prefer the, the newer definition or are they using survivor? I think a lot of people would like to have a term other than survivor. It makes them feel like they are um, isolated in some way or victimized in some way. And um, certainly the, no one does anything to make them get cancer. Uh, but no one's come up with another better term yet. So. I challenge somebody to come up with another term, uh, but uh, we hear that a lot of things. Something it, it makes them feel too victimized, and they'd like something better than that. So, right. Thank you. Um, the next question we have: um, Do you have anything you'd like to share about integrative oncologists? Yeah. So, uh, so that's a great question. So, I think. Um, if we could go on and on, that could be sort of a lecture in and of itself. But one thing that I'll share is just, it's important to think about the terminology a little bit. So um, we have an integrative health program here at Massey. And when we think about integrative, it's really important to, to make sure that we're talking about things that are adjuncts to, um, to the conventional oncology care. So when we are thinking about what can we use uh, from an integrative uh, oncology standpoint, we're thinking about what can we what can we do to help enhance the the surgery or um, 
chemotherapy or radiation, or what can we do to help with any possible side effects related to those conventional therapies? And how can we really take a holistic approach to sort to support that patient? Um, there are a lot of people that are interested in a lot of different aspects of integrative therapy. Um, and um, in the literature, they really break those down into, you know, uh, body-based methods, things like, you know, yoga, uh, med uh, meditation, um, they talk about massage. A lot of people are interested in a lot of herbal supplements, and uh, we do some separate talks and education on herbal supplements. Um, and there's a lot of really great uh, resources online, particularly the uh, Memorial Sloan Cancer Center has um, uh, an app called About Herbs that has a lot of education about, about herbs. So I do think there's a, there's a lot of ways to incorporate um, integrative modalities into therapy. Uh, the most important thing is really to talk to your oncologist about it. Um, there are, you know, we, we definitely are, um, are interested in hearing about what your interests are, what are your, what kind of side effects you may be experiencing so we can point you in the right direction. And of course, it's important to know that for herbal supplements and some of those other things, um, those things can have side effects too, and sometimes drug interactions. And so it's really important if somebody's interested in those, or if they're already taking something like that, that they disclose that and have a really open conversation uh, with their oncologist to make sure that uh, what they're doing is first and foremost safe, um, but then also to, you know, to try to provide some resources about how they can achieve, achieve their goals, whatever it is that they're trying to, um, trying to enhance uh, or whatever they're trying to do with those particular supplements or modalities. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you both Dr. Ross and Dr. Hackney. We're ending time now. So it was such a pleasure having both of you join us for this educational webinar. I'm glad that we had the opportunity to discuss the importance of developing a follow-up care plan and how to maintain health um, after completing your cancer treatment. So thank you both. Our pl my pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. And to everyone who joined, if you'd like to learn more about life after completing cancer treatment, visit vcuhealth.org or visit masseycancercenter.org or follow VCU Health and at Massey Cancer Center on Facebook. Once again, thank you both for joining us for this educational webinar. And to all who joined us tonight, have a great night. Very good.